Welcome back to another edition of Written on the Pitch, starring Jessica Charman. How are you, Jess? Doing good. A little hoarse after a busy weekend, but excited to be back and apologies if anyone missed the show last week. Yeah, you know, we had some stuff going on. You had games to call. I had games to call. And, and we finally got a chance to call a game together again. I did not realize until you tweeted it that it had been over a year since we had yeah. called a game at Oglethorpe. It's really incredible, isn't it, how that 2020 became kind of like a blackout year. And the last time we called together would have been the final of the conference tournament, I believe. Yeah, it would have been like November of 19. Um, that's a long time, but it like it doesn't feel like it because of how weird 2020 was. We just had an extended March of 2020 that kept going and going and going and going. Um, yes. But we had a chance to call the UPSL National Championship match on Sunday. I called the uh, the rest of the national finals. And, you know, I was telling you about it before, you know, you, you came out to call that match of, one, just how good the level was um, and, and what to expect with that game. I did sell you on goals in the final, and we didn't see any until the penalty <laughs> shootout. So I apologize for that. But what do you think of the, the match as a whole between Jenga Atlanta and Olympians from Arizona? Look, big picture stuff first. I'm going to be honest. I think I've been sleeping on UPSL as a league. Um, it's one of those where because it is so large with so many teams in it and lots of different uh, divisions and regional areas, sometimes you forget about it. But I went in not really knowing what to expect other than what I'd heard from you and was really impressed with the level and um, just the real mix between former pros, young stars, people that are, haven't even played in college yet. I think that's what makes it such a unique style of play. Yeah, and, and these were two teams that that do try to play and, and had identities. And I think that's one of the hardest things about teams at that you know, amateur or semi-pro level, just because of the nature of it. You know, it's not a, a full-time profession, so... You know, guys have jobs, guys have families, guys have responsibilities, and it's hard to develop a, a, a philosophy and an identity. And both of these clubs had it. You know, both clubs committed to playing good soccer. I mean, we saw Jenga have to adapt to playing with 10 men towards the end of the match. But you had two clubs with two good managers who did not play at an amateur kind of level at all. No, and that was it. You, you're expecting maybe fitness levels to not be up there because it is that amateur level. But for a Jenga in particular to have to play for 20 minutes of regular time plus full uh, extra time with 10 players, their conditioning was incredible. And this is in a year where prep generally because of COVID has been so different as well. So that was impressive for me. And I think what impressed me the most, though, like you say, was the style of football that these teams were playing. They were so well coached. They knew what they were trying to do. They were able to adjust to adversity. And this, remember, the semifinals were just on Friday. So the, the turnaround was so intense as well. Yeah, and both semifinals went 3-2. Both teams had a lot to deal with in those games. Uh, Jenga fell behind 1-0 and then went up to a 3-1 lead with 10 men again and gave up a late goal and had to see it out. Olympians went up to a 2-0 lead and lost it, and it got to 2-2, and they had to find a winner. So both of them expended a, a ton of energy. They delivered a really good final. You had a chance to call a game with an, an Argentine production crew, uh, Vetter Media, which was a lot of fun for me. Um, it was a very different style than I was used to, but I really enjoyed it. What did you think? I thought it was brilliant. I, and when I watch it back, what I'm so impressed with is the style of replays that we got. It yeah. was one of those where it felt like the producers were in my head. A lot of the time, uh, occasionally you get moments where you see a replay and you're kind of confused about what that replay's purpose was. On Sunday, it felt like every replay was exactly what I wanted to talk about. So that was enjoyable. It was definitely a lot more quick fire than I'm used to. And we weren't necessarily told that a replay was coming. So you had to have eyes in the back of your head, one on the screen, one on the, the real action, but really impressive, really fun. And what was nice was the positive feedback we received for the call as well. Yeah, it was it was very cool. Um, it was a lot of fun working with UPSLs, a lot of fun working with, with Vetter and all the, the local folks at, at Silverbacks Park and, and the UPSL Georgia crew. 
um, other media who was there with, with some some little nuggets of information that helped us along the way throughout the weekend. So thanks to everybody at UPSL. Hopefully we'll get a chance to, to call some more UPSL championship matches uh, down the road. I'm looking forward to it. You've been calling some college as well lately. Um, you mentioned kind of how difficult it is for, for any team right now, whether it's Atlanta United, whether it's a, a club like Jenga Atlanta. Colleges are dealing with it too. You know, what are you seeing in, in the college games that you're calling right now that does it feel different than it normally does in a fall season? Are there things that are surprising about the level or the fitness, anything like that? I think the toughest thing is how unpredictable it is based on the schedule. You've got these players that are used to playing in college two matches a week with a, a, a turnaround. It's always a predictable schedule, whether in D1, a lot of the time it's Friday, Sunday. In D2, it might be a Tuesday, Saturday turnaround. But you're used to consistent amounts of games, quick and fast. Right now, the biggest issue is with COVID protocols, which, again, fantastic work from all the divisions to have this instilled in the schools to protect the players. But with them being very strict and it only taking a matter of a few contacts for a game to be cancelled, there isn't that same predictability with the schedule when teams are playing a game and then not playing another match for three weeks. And perhaps at the professional level, that turnaround can be helpful. It gives you time to prep. But in college level, when you're used to kind of having that very fast turnaround, you might have a poor result midweek, but you have the weekend to make up for it. Teams aren't getting that turnaround at this point. They're having to wait a long time. They're not getting enough time with practice if they're having to have players out for COVID protocols. So the biggest thing I'm noticing in terms of issues on the pitch would be that you can tell that players aren't always on the same page. By now, a few matches in, you would expect the weight of the pass to be there or the movement off the ball to be um, on the same wavelength. That's taking a little bit more time to sort of click in a lot of matches. It's tough because of that that contact tracing element. You know, we we were going to call a game in the fall in Chattanooga and it was wiped out because of contact tracing with one of the teams after somebody tested positive, I think down to a roommate situation, something like that, a roommate tested positive. And with um, college soccer, everyone lives together. Yeah. So the minute one person, and I think that's my experience, if one person had been exposed, we'd have all been exposed because everyone lives together, you eat together, you train together. So it's extremely difficult, particularly if they don't have wide testing and they just have to go off contact tracing. You have to clear these games. And yes, I would say that teams don't necessarily look quite gelled together, but considering all the adversity they've gone through, I'm still impressed with the speed of play and the fitness. On Friday, the Chattanooga game went to overtime and double overtime at that. Two two overtime games in a weekend, so that might explain my hoarse voice, but... <laughs> the way they were able to adapt and play and still have that fitness was very impressive. Yeah, it's tough. It's it's tough for the players at any level right now, um, all the way down to youth. I mean, you've got youth clubs that are playing and just trying to to navigate You know what we're all dealing with. Hopefully not for a whole lot longer. Hopefully things will start to feel more normal by the end of the year and we'll have a normal fall college season. Um, we'll have championships at the D2 and D3 levels and – Hopefully we get that with the, the pros as well. We'll talk about Atlanta United here in a minute, and, and they're in their preseason and kind of some of the things that, that preseason can be from a playing perspective. But I want to talk about the FA Women's Super League as well. Um, I just saw an article in the Daily Mail that the Women's Super League has attracted a rights fee for television for the first time um, from the BBC who will show games on their main network channels. Uh, Sky Fantastic. Sports will have the first pick of the games, but uh, and they'll be the primary broadcaster. BBC will be the secondary rights partner and is paying to broadcast these games. That's huge. Absolutely. And when you think about BBC and it being on free television and the amount of people – Everyone that has a TV and a TV license has access to BBC, particularly if they're putting it on their mainstream channels. So that's a huge step that they want to give. You know, those are very valuable spots when it comes to TV. So BBC has to now see that there's a value in women's soccer and it's going to pull a big enough audience to make it worthwhile for them. So it's a huge step. And that's another thing that might attract more players. They're already seeing more players come internationally to the Women's Super, uh, to the women's super League, but more people 
want to play if they're going to be televised, if they're going to have that opportunity to be on mainstream television. So it's a huge step. It's it's massive. And the the rights fee is is mostly coming from Sky to be that primary broadcaster, but BBC is is paying money to get this. And the main reason the BBC is doing it, there, there's a couple different, I think, really important ratings numbers to, to keep in mind here. Now, one's a World Cup number, which is a whole different animal. 2019 World Cup, the semifinal, England, USA, 11.7 million viewers on BBC One, which is wild. Um, mm-hmm. I think the more impressive one, though, is the women's football show on BBC, which is on a, a what a, like kind of a late night slot on Sundays, if I'm not mistaken. Um, it's not the greatest of time slots to draw a big rating, but it averages over 500,000 viewers per week. And that's probably the biggest thing that would commit the BBC to saying, well, if, if we're throwing that on a Sunday night and it's still getting over 500,000 viewers, yeah, we can put games on our main channels and do just fine. A hundred percent. Because you'd expect, like you say, primetime TV, obviously you're going to see people uh, wanting to watch those spots, even if you just accidentally switch on the channel. But when it's a late night show, people are purposefully staying up to watch it. People aren't accidentally turning on uh, a show at that time of night. So I think what's happening now is you're getting more neutrals. There's not necessarily as many dedicated fans, but more people are looking and seeing, okay, well, I feel like watching some soccer. I want to watch some footy. Let me just tune into this one. There's not as much... um, People are less concerned about whether they're watching men's or women's soccer, and they're actually just wanting to watch some quality soccer. And that's the biggest thing that I think is starting to change here, because there, you know, we've talked about it before. There was this perception that it was such a difference for the women's game, and and we've tried to explain that it is really not. Like the only thing that that is really different to me. I mean, tactics are the same, philosophy is the same. Like we start talking about building out of the back or positional play or, or what kind of formation this team's playing. It's all the same men and women. You know, like is the pace a little different? Sure. And, and that's okay. You know, I think in a lot of ways for casual fans, it's almost better that it's not as fast when you're talking about tactics and learning about the game because you see things develop really well. And, yeah, and it, definitely. It, it, it's just such a critical element to teaching the game. I've learned as much or more from from watching high-level women's games as high-level men's games. Yeah, and you're right, Jason. Sometimes for those new fans, it can be a starting point of seeing the tactics play out in front of you more easily. Like you say, they are, the speed of play is slightly lower, so you're going to see those moments develop quicker, big-picture stuff. And I've also been impressed with the level of commentary in the women's game and the, the former players that particularly in England, they're able to pull. They've got the likes of Karen Carney. They've got the likes of Siobhan Chamberlain. And because these players have played at this level and they have great vision, they're able to break it down for that neutral fan. And as a talking point, it's so important to have those voices of the game that are able to digest what's going on in front of them and give it to a, a fan at a level that is easily understood. Yeah, it's, it's a vital element. And that's another huge growth for the women's game and this tv deal with with sky and bbc is is massive it's a good competition this season as well chelsea and manchester city are at the top manchester united six points off of the the title chase there's a a fairly big drop off six more points down to arsenal and fourth from a, a champions league perspective which is is going on on the women's side right now in uefa Chelsea and Manchester City would go straight into the second round. Manchester United would go into the first round. The top three go. The relegation side is a battle as well, and that's maybe the the really fascinating side of the FA Women's Super League this year with the bottom five separated by four points, and only the bottom team goes down. And right now that is West Ham, although they have games in hand. As you've been keeping an eye on the the FA Women's Super League, and I, I know you're watching your your beloved Reading, but who is uh who is standing out to you? Are there any certain players that maybe we don't know yet that we should? Look, for me, I just love how the quality of the league. You talk about how close it is at the bottom, and again, that you could look at that as a negative thing for those teams because they're all competing against relegation. But at the same time, sometimes you can flip that on its head and say, well, actually, it's that everyone is so equal that there isn't one team that doesn't deserve 
to be in the division. Mm -hmm. In the past with the Super League, you would have had someone that you would bet your money on that I don't want to say didn't belong there, but that would almost be how it felt. You know, they would be getting blown out every single week. But now anyone can be anyone. And you talked about my beloved Reading and look at Bristol City this weekend. You had Bristol City who have barely won a game, but they beat Reading 3-2. So it's so much fun when you have games where Reading can beat Man United on one week, but then get beaten by Bristol City. It's that competitiveness of the level that needs to be emphasized more than ever. One player that is starting to stand out to me, um, she's had time with the England national team, but she's having an incredible season for Manchester City. Six goals and nine assists on the year. Chloe Kelly. Yeah, and when you're saying about those sort of numbers, Everyone can have a good game, right? But she's scoring in a lot of different games. And when you're hot and you're finishing on regular matches, that's when you really know that it's a player that isn't just having a one-off success. They're consistently good. And what I'm liking about the Lionesses this time around is that because there are so many English players playing in the WPSL, we're able to see more players compete and give the difficulty of whether this is going to be a new generation of the Lionesses versus potentially just bringing in the same players from future uh, past World Cups. That's huge. And that's something that, you know, we've talked about it from the the U.S. perspective. It's, It's felt like, okay, it's the same roster. It's the same people. It's the same people from 2019 right now. It's the same people from 2015 right now. And you know, I look at the, the goal-scoring chart in the league this year, and yes, Fran Kirby is the leading English scorer at, with 11. Ellen White's next. But then Bethany England, Leah Galton, Chloe Kelly, Ebony Solomon, Ella Toon. All players who have maybe are in had... the fringes. Yeah, they're, They've been on the fringes, they're in and around, and now what's happening is you're starting to wonder which ones of those fringes make their mark on the team. And it also keeps players like Kirby on their on their toes because they've been dead selects, like 100% ins. And yes, you're still going to expect to see the likes of White and Kirby picked, but they're going to have that bit of competition on their shoulder now where it's not necessarily a guaranteed place. And in certain preseason matches, uh, maybe you see players drop to give other people a chance and then that's the moment where they truly believe that okay we have an opportunity that we might get selected particularly with a new manager coming in yeah it's it's so important with that new manager coming in after the olympics to impress in in the league i think it's raising the level for everybody the the two big games of this weekend or this upcoming at least upcoming next match day it's actually kind of spread out uh, Everton and Chelsea on March 17th at 3 p.m. And then Arsenal and Manchester United on Friday, Huge. March 19th at 2.30. That's a big one. Yeah, that's going to be a really fun one to watch. Super competitive. But it might be one of those games, and we talked about this actually on Sunday with the final, when you have these big matchups, sometimes you get off to a tentative start because neither team wants to show all their cards early on. Yeah, it, it can happen that way sometimes. Um, you're getting a little bit later in the season, and this is really Arsenal's last chance to cut into that gap to try to get into a Champions League spot. Right now, Manchester United's got third pretty well on lock. I don't know if they're going to be able to get any higher and compete with the top two. So Arsenal's got a lot to, to play for here. So maybe that tweaks it and makes them have to come out on the front foot a little bit. Um, another thing on the women's game that is coming up is we're about to have another uh, set of international matches, and a huge one was just announced for Big Fox in the United States, USA and Sweden. That's one versus five in the FIFA rankings. That's the games we want to see the U.S. have, though. We've yep. talked about this. Yep. We want them playing against more competitive teams because she believes cup. Yes, we saw some flaws and we saw some slightly more competitive games than we would expect it. But realistically, was it a true challenge? No, this one could actually be a closer matchup and you learn so much more in those games. Yeah, this is a big one. Saturday, April 10th at 1 p.m. on Fox. And it's another commitment. You know, we've talked about it with the BBC and Sky. Fox is right here too. Um, the She Believes Cup earned some incredible TV ratings for Fox, and they're putting the commitment of putting a U.S. women's match with Sweden, a friendly but a meaningful one, on you know broadcast TV on a Saturday afternoon. And that shows 
not just the commitment to growing the women's game, but the, that next step of it's a good business decision to do it. And that's it. I think in the past, maybe people have seen women's soccer as the sort of edgy thing to do. It, it We want to support, you know, the up and coming game. But now it's kind of lost that. I don't want to say charity case appeal, but you, you'll understand my phrasing yeah. there. And now it's actually bringing in income and they're choosing it for that reason rather than just to be seen as supporting the the diversity. Yeah, it's it's important because you'll get somebody doing good things out of goodwill for a time, maybe a second time. But if it's not a good business decision by a business <laughs> They won't keep doing it out of just goodwill, or you won't have any real say over when they decide to give you um, something out of goodwill. If you're proving to be a good business partner or a good product, then you'll keep getting those opportunities. And, and that's, I think, the turning point that we've seen with these last couple of, of World Cups on the women's side, that, look, if you want to put something on TV that's going to draw a big rating, Women's soccer can do that for you. If you want to advertise on something that's going to have a lot of eyeballs on it, this is a good product for you. And whether it's the FA Women's Super League and WSL with the Challenge Cup getting underway here very soon with national team play, it's not what it used to be. And it is a good business decision to invest in women's soccer. A hundred percent. And I think it's going to continue to grow like that the more that people start watching and enjoying the game for what it is, which, again, we, we maybe sound like a broken record, but it is that it's just good soccer to watch. Yep. it's There's a lot of young, exciting players coming up. Um, I can't wait to see Trinity Rodman in the NWSL this year. Uh, she's doing very well in preseason for the Washington Spirit. Can't wait till we have an NWSL team in Atlanta to see. And a lot of people are starting to beat that drum a little bit louder, a little bit and harder. And we need people to continue to do that. That's mm-hmm. the thing. People need to be vocal about it because what I love about Atlanta United is, or Atlanta in general, is when the public speaks, a lot of the time they respond. Absolutely. And I think they will in this case. I think, if anything, maybe things got slowed down because of uh, COVID and just how difficult it's been over the last year i I hope as we get you know out of it and start to get further out of it that these plans can can come back into fruition because i mean i I will always remember it was the last home game we had with fans at mercedes-benz stadium arthur blank joined mike and i for pregame on 92.9 and we didn't ask him he said it himself that they're looking at the NWSL and they were really starting to explore what that could be for the club, for him individually, for his family of businesses. And, you know, that he, he brought that up on his own, which makes you think that that's it, a, yeah. When you're not having thing. to pry it out of him, when yeah. he's vocally saying it, it shows how much this is something that he's passionate about and yeah. wants to make happen. It was front of mind for him. And I understand from a business perspective, okay, maybe, Maybe priorities shifted a little bit over the last 12 months, but things will get back there. So, yes, if you are out there and you want NWSL2 Atlanta, hashtag it, tweet about it, post Instagrams about it, like be vocal about it. And I think you'll see it here soon. We'll talk a lot about the Challenge Cup and and all of that as we get closer to it. But we've we've mentioned Atlanta United. They are in preseason now. The first preseason match is on Saturday behind closed doors against South Georgia Tormenta, USL League One team from Statesboro. Um, Not sure how much we'll see or hear about that one, but what I wanted to ask you was, I think people have a gist of what a preseason is like for a field player. And you know, there's a lot of fitness work, uh, depending on the manager. There's a lot of work with the ball. For some, there, there's less. Uh, for others, it's, everything's with the ball. What is a preseason like for a goalkeeper? A real mix. Honestly, I loved preseason. It was hell in terms of the physical drain on your body, but it's also one of the most enjoyable times of my career because it's when you really get to, to push yourself to your limits and see how that work you've done in the off season comes to fruition I one of my biggest pet peeves is that a lot of times people assume that goalkeepers don't have as much of a physical demand on their body but they do Uh, and it's a different sort of physical demand right like you talk about the field players and a lot of the time yeah they're having to do mile runs for times and yo-yo tests and bleep tests and all of that stuff well 
at least in my experience, the goalkeepers still had to do that too. But on top of that, goalkeeping and preseason up, down, up, down workouts, imagine doing 100 burpees, you know, constantly, because that's pretty much what preseason was for us. It was a lot of short, sharp reaction work. It was a lot of up, down, up, down. I remember one of the craziest workouts we used to do was um, burpee to kettlebell swings. So you would be doing uh, uh, 20 burpees, 20 kettlebell swings, 19 burpees, 19 kettlebell swings, all the way down to zero. And if you didn't throw up by the end of that one, then you clearly weren't having the right form. So there's all sorts of physical tolls on your body when it comes to the physical fitness component. But then on the flip side, you've got to talk about the mental challenges because you might be dealing with a new back line. You might be dealing with a new formation. In the case of Atlanta United, you're dealing with a new coach who is going to ask completely different things of you than what you might have got used to. So there's a lot of mental work. There's a lot of show tape. You might go back and look at what your strengths and weaknesses were in the last season. And you have to be really mentally tough as a goalkeeper because it can be very difficult watching yourself and being criticized because we've talked about this before on the show, the difference between a goalkeeper being criticized and a field player being criticized is a lot of the time the goalkeeper feels isolated in that criticism. As much as there's the old saying, it's got to be 10 players before it gets to you. When you're focusing on the floors of the goalkeeper, a lot of the time it feels like it's just honed in on you. Yeah, it's tough. Um, it's tough when you see, and and it's usually very evident when a goalkeeper is is struggling with that. I mean, we've seen it here recently with Allison with Liverpool. Uh, before that, we saw the the Champions League final where you know it all kind of fell apart for Carius, and and I will always believe that he was concussed in that oh, game. Oh, I a hundred percent. When you look at the decision making he made in that mm-hmm. game, that wasn't. Uh, a lax of concentration that was a, a hindrance in the way his mind was functioning. Yeah, he had taken that hit to the head that I didn't even notice in real time, um, just the way it was shown on television. And I mean, it's it's just these these things. And I don't know if he's really even bounced back from that because of the combination. You know, it's out of his control what happened to him. Uh, and these days with the power of social media, look, we can use social media for a lot of good. We were talking about, you know, tweeting about getting a, a women's Super League team here. But it's not possible sometimes to recover when you are trolled as hard as some of these players get yeah. trolled and the abuse. And if you use social media for the wrong reasons, it can be very detrimental to people's livelihoods. Yeah, absolutely. And and that's the hardest thing about being a goalkeeper is I think, you know, if you're watching um, as a fan and you, you see a, a goal scored on your team, you might not notice that the holding midfielder was out of position. You, you might not notice that the winger gave the ball away cheaply in, in the middle third. You will notice who the ball passed last and it'll be the goalkeeper. And a lot of times that finger gets pointed there. And Jason, we have such an important role as commentators too, to not necessarily educate, but if we're going to critique a goalkeeper, we need to be sure that it really was something. A lot of the time we see people very easy to point at the goalkeeper when they might not necessarily know goalkeeping to a same depth. And I do feel like that's something that makes me unique because I do understand the role of the goalkeeper. And sometimes when you're watching television and you're watching these games televised, how quickly commentators can go on to the goalkeeper or they can talk about how that was an easy save when they don't really understand what allowed it to be an easy save can be really tough. Yeah, I mean, I I learn more things about goalkeeping when I call games with you. I, I like watching... Chicago Fire Games on ESPN Plus with Tony Miola. I think he does a really good job of of zeroing in on the goalkeeper's role, not just in in saves, but just in the 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 run of play. And I think he does such a good job in pointing those things out. That's going to be an important element here in Atlanta this year. Atlanta United's going to play a very high line. That space between usually midfield and the goal. It's going to be wide open and Mm -hmm. the easy play for a lot of teams if they're able to to deal with Atlanta's pressure up high because you can't just play a high line and not press the ball. It's not going to work that way because then teams can just chip balls in and yeah, you might miss three, but you hit one and it's a goal the other way and that's all you need. You have to have somebody to fill that space. We know Miles Robinson can recover 
and and fill a lot of space. He does an amazing job with that. But you're going to need your goalkeepers for Atlanta United to do that. And Brad Gazan has played in systems where he's had to cover space before, but this feels like a whole different animal. He's going to have to function as a field player quite often. Yeah, it's a really tough one when you have that gap because the main thing it boils down to is your starting position Mm -hmm. because you're going to have to have a far more aggressive starting position with that high line because you have to fill that space. Now, what that puts you at risk at is, number one, misjudging any balls. It's really difficult to read a ball in the air sometimes. And I think to the Mercedes-Benz Stadium, I think about the turf and I think about how unpredictable a hop can be on turf. You know, you might be expecting a ball to bounce favorably and then suddenly it takes a wild bounce off of the rubber bits and suddenly you're completely out of position. So there's going to be a lot of practice for the likes of Brad Guzan on reading the ball in the air and dealing with unfavorable bounces and being able to to backpedal back as quick as you can if you misread something. And the biggest one as well for me is making your decision and sticking to it. As goalkeepers, you're taught you have to commit. There's a very few chances you'll see that go your way if you get caught in two minds. You're going to get caught in what they call no man's land. So if let's say it's Brad in goal, if he decides, okay, I'm going to come on to this one, you better come and you better come 110%. If you have doubts in your mind, you're going to end up getting caught. You're going to be too slow to get there and likely you're going to have a forward coming at you. And that's when you get into that nervous moment of do I take him down and risk a red card or do I let him pass me? Yeah, it's that's going to be fascinating. We saw it in a game Saturday morning. Uh, Hoffenheim, I believe, was the team who benefited from it, where uh, it was late in the game, and, and the game was pretty much decided. This would have set up goal number three and would have sealed it. It would have finished 3-1. But player breaks away, goalkeeper's chasing back after being up for a corner at the very end. You could see the goalkeeper as he's chasing back say, you know what, it ain't worth it. I'm not committing the foul because I can't get suspended for the next game. Like all he could do was really grab the guy. So he kind of like peels off and a defender comes flying in with one of the worst tackles I've ever seen in my life <laughs> and, and commits the foul. But does it outside the box and tried to play the ball so he didn't get a red card. Everything ended up winning. But you see that decision making from goalkeepers and it it's such an underrated element of the position where yeah like thinking about a potential red card being in play it impacts your decision on on making that challenge when you're covering the space that you're going to see particularly early on in a game you yeah. know when it's late on in a game you might think okay let me take the red it's better off the, particularly in a close game imagine it's nil nil 89th minute right. at that point okay we see defenders do it with handballs on the line as well. At that point, it makes sense because if we concede now, we don't really have an opportunity to get back in it. Ten players isn't going to be too detrimental. Now, if you're in minute one, sometimes you're thinking, you know what? It's better to concede at this point and not take the risk than put my team down for 90 minutes with ten players. Yeah, the the, the situation... The game state, there's so many factors that go into it. And it's just such a a position that if you haven't played it, and especially if you haven't played it at a high level, you might not understand how challenging the goalkeeper position is. And for a team implementing a new philosophy, it's it's an essential part of it because Atlanta United can't be successful without strong goalkeeper play. And that's not just saving shots. No. And it's mentally exhausting. That's the thing. I remember playing matches where maybe I didn't touch the I or I would have touched the ball a lot with my feet, but maybe I had one save, you know, when it came to the stat sheet. But I would be mentally exhausted because the focus that's required with goalkeeping, you might not do anything until minute 89. And in the 89th minute, you have one of those one on ones where you have to make the decision to come. And that's what can be so draining for a goalkeeper is that Necess- the necessity to be focused for 100, 100 minutes with stoppage time. You would appreciate it right now on, on Teise out of Argentina. They are showing uh, goalkeeper collisions with attacking players. Oof. <laughs> I don't know if I'd appreciate it or, or have some horrible <laughs> flashbacks, Jason. I well, might get PTSD. One that there is, it's a horrible flashback for Argentines is uh, Manuel Neuer on the edge of the 18, it was inside the 18 when he came out and just wrecked uh, Gonzalo Higuain in the final in 2014 and did not have a penalty called on him. Argentines still have some issues with that one. Um, 
kind of a bad call. But uh, goalkeepers get protected in some ways. We know this, and that's not always a bad thing. I know, hashtag GK Union and all. But sometimes you all get a chance to take some oh, shots on players. 100%. Look at... <laughs> Look at how much goalkeepers get away with at corners when they go flapping and go down. I mean, it, again, it's gamesmanship, but mm-hmm. it's the smartest sort of gamesmanship. We see players that do take that extra role when they've been fouled, that stay down a little bit longer or yep. that run the clock. Well, a goalkeeper, if they know they've messed up, why not go down? You know, why not? It's just part of the game. And look, we would love for soccer to be played fairly and everyone to be completely honest all the time. But you got to you got to use what you have in your toolbox sometimes. Yeah, you do. It, it's a, it is all part of the game. It's not all dark arts. Sometimes it is just gamesmanship and it's it's a step below the dark arts. We'll talk, I'm sure, more about goalkeeping dark arts and goalkeeping fitness and, and the FA Women's Super League and the NWSL and international friendlies and anything else that comes up between now and next week. You guys out there listening, if you have questions that you want to fire off for this show, you can always tweet at us at Soccer Down Here. You can tweet at Just Talks Footy with an IE. You can tweet at me at Longshoe. You can also, if you're one of our subscribers on Twitch or one of our Patreon members, we have a specific channel in our Discord that you are invited to that you can submit questions there. Next week, we will take a bunch of questions from you guys about anything, whatever you want to get into, whether it's commentary, whether it's goalkeeping, whether it's Atlanta United, whether it is the women's game, whatever you want to touch on, we'll dig deep into that next week. Jess, it was a blast calling a game with you Sunday. It's always fun to talk soccer with you here, and we'll talk to you next week. Yes, can't wait. Send those questions in.